Hello, Dr. Grande here. Today I will be updating the case of Karen Reed. This is a controversial case involving a collision that may have occurred during a snowstorm in Massachusetts in 2022. This case has attracted a lot of attention from the media, and there's a lot of people who have strong feelings about what's going on in this situation. First, I'll look at the background of the case of Karen Reed, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. Karen Reed was born in 1980 and grew up in Taunton, Massachusetts, which is about an hour south of Boston. After graduating from high school, she attended Bentley University. In 2001, she earned a bachelor's degree in finance. She would later earn her master's degree and PhD in finance from the same school. Karen lived in Mansfield and worked as a financial analyst and as an adjunct professor. Sometime around 2020, Karen became romantically involved with a man named John O'Keefe. They reconnected after having dated when they were in their 20s. John had a master's degree in criminal justice and worked as a police officer for the Boston Police Department since 2006. Karen spent most nights in John's house in Canton, Massachusetts, which is about 20 minutes north of her residence in Mansfield. The relationship between Karen and John was tumultuous. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On Saturday, January 29, 2022, at 6.04 a.m., the police received a 911 call reporting that John O'Keefe had been found in the snow. He was near a house at 34 Fairview Road in Canton, Massachusetts, which was owned by a police officer named Brian Albert. At this time, there was heavy snow, and the temperature was in the teens. Emergency responders arrived at the scene. They encountered four people, John O'Keefe, Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts. John was on the ground. He was cold to the touch and not breathing. He was transported to a hospital where the staff determined he was deceased. His cause of death was blunt force trauma to his head. Hypothermia also contributed. Here's what the police found during the course of their investigation. On January 28, the day before John's body was discovered in the snow, he and Karen stopped by two bars across the street from one another in Canton. When they were at the second bar, they met up with several friends, including Brian Albert. Again, he owned that house at 34 Fairview Road. Not long after midnight, now on January 29, Brian invited John, Karen, and a few other people back to his house. Karen and John departed the bar at 12.11 a.m. and drove to Brian's house. According to Karen, she said that John went into the house to check it out, to make sure that this was a place they wanted to visit. She saw John open the front door, but never actually saw him enter the house. Like he opened the front door and put his head through a little bit, but that's all she saw. She expected John to return in a few minutes to report about the conditions in the house, but he never did. Karen was upset, so she drove back to John's house in Canton. During the early morning hours, a snowstorm hit the area. Karen said that she woke up and noticed that John never returned home. She called him and sent him text messages, but there was no response. At this point, Karen contacted Jennifer McCabe and Carrie Roberts. Again, these two women were at the scene when first responders arrived. She wanted to enlist their help in finding John. All three women drove back to Brian Albert's house where John was unresponsive in the snow outside. Jennifer called 911 at 6.04 a.m. In the snow around John's body, investigators found red and clear plastic consistent with a broken vehicle taillight. When they examined Karen's black 2021 Lexus LX 570 SUV, they noticed that the rear passenger taillight was broken. The police believe that Karen backed her Lexus into John, and this led to his death. On February 1, 2022, Karen was arrested in connection with John's death. On June 10 of that same year, she was indicted for second-degree murder, manslaughter while operating under the influence of alcohol, and leaving the scene of personal injury and death. What seemed like a fairly straightforward case soon became a complicated mess that attracted a lot of attention from the public. Many people came to believe that Karen was innocent. She had been framed for John's murder. 
This was done by evil conspirators who were determined to conceal the involvement of the real killers. Karen's supporters believed that one or more people in the house at 34 Fairview Road must have beaten John to death. Furthermore, they thought that Brian Albert's German shepherd bit or clawed John on the arm. This would explain some injuries that John had on his arm. On April 16, 2024, Karen's trial started. Crowds of people gathered as close to the courthouse as they were permitted and protested vigorously. It was like a big party. In the courthouse, the Commonwealth, which I will refer to as the state for the sake of simplicity, called 68 witnesses. The defense only called six witnesses. The jury started deliberating on June 25. The members of the jury were unable to reach a unanimous decision. They had drastically different interpretations of the evidence presented at trial. On July 1, 2024, the judge declared a mistrial. Karen will be retried on all three charges. Her trial is scheduled to begin on January 27, 2025. Now moving to my analysis. Karen Reed maintains her innocence, and she has a massive number of excited and enthusiastic supporters. They believe there is a massive conspiracy by law enforcement to frame her. So this is bigger than just one person's guilt or innocence. They've made this into a discussion about the police in general. The state, of course, disagrees. They argue the evidence of Karen's guilt is overwhelming. This brings me to the question, in light of all the evidence that was presented at her trial, do I believe that Karen is guilty? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. On the night John was killed, Karen consumed nine drinks. Hours later, when her BAC was tested, it was 0.09%. This means her BAC at the time of John's death was probably between 0.13% and 0.29%. This is above the legal limit for driving in Massachusetts. The limit is 0.08%. According to Jennifer McCabe, when Karen Reed spoke to her on January 29 at 4.30 a.m., Karen acted like she last saw John at the bar they were at. Karen only changed her story after Jennifer reminded her that she saw her leave the bar with John. This makes it seem like Karen was trying to avoid acknowledging that she dropped John off at Brian's house. She was trying to distance herself from John's movements. Karen eventually admitted that she dropped John off at the Fairview Road house, but 11 witnesses at the party said that John never entered the house. Not a single witness had a different story. Investigators discovered that the rear passenger side taillight of Karen's Lexus was broken, and pieces consistent with this taillight were found near John's body. Data from her Lexus indicated that Karen drove in reverse at 24 miles per hour. Drivers typically do not exceed around 5 to 7 miles per hour in reverse. Her 5,800-pound vehicle suddenly slowed down even though the accelerator was still pushed down, as if the vehicle had hit something heavy. John O'Keefe weighed over 200 pounds. When Karen left John's house at 5.08 a.m., so this is after he was allegedly struck by her vehicle, she backed into his Chevy SUV with the rear passenger side corner of her Lexus SUV. The contact was made on or near the rear passenger side taillight, which makes it seem like this is what could have caused the taillight to be damaged. The problem is the police did not find any taillight fragments at John's house. There is evidence suggesting that the relationship between Karen and John wasn't going too well. John's niece and nephew said that Karen and John argued two or three times a week. John may have been getting ready to end their romantic relationship. In the week prior to January 29, John told Karen that the relationship had run its course and it was not healthy. Text messages on John's phone referred to the relationship as toxic. Karen accused John of cheating on her during a recent trip to Aruba, allegedly flirted with another man, and left impolite voicemails on John's phone. For example, Karen screamed, you're a blanking loser, blank yourself, and I blanking hate you. Karen made several comments suggesting that she could have struck John with her vehicle. She asked Jennifer, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? 
Karen mentioned to Jennifer how one of her taillights had been damaged. At the scene, four paramedics heard Karen repeatedly say, I hit him. When Karen, Jennifer, and Carrie pulled on the Fairview Road, Karen noticed John's body in the snow 12 feet from the road. This is during a snowstorm where the visibility wasn't too good. The other two women did not see him, and they wondered how Karen saw him. It's almost like Karen knew where his body was. The defense suggested that the lead investigator, Michael Proctor, could have planted the taillight fragments at the Fairview Road residence. But the police reports indicate that he was never alone with Karen's vehicle, and he never returned to the house. It is, of course, possible that he had someone else take the fragments back. The defense suggested that Jennifer McCabe searched the internet at 2.27 a.m. for the term, how long to die in the cold. She misspelled the word how, but that's what she was trying to say. This was before she contacted Karen. However, an expert for the state said the browser was opened at 2.27 a.m. The search actually occurred at 6.20 a.m. Jennifer said that Karen asked her to make the search. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. There were no witnesses to John's death, no video. He could have been hit by another vehicle. He could have been beaten to death. Just about anything could have happened to him. Karen's defense has suggested that John was killed in a physical altercation. Investigators claim there was no evidence that John had been in a fight. However, there were six lacerations on his right arm. DNA from a pig was found on John's shirt. The defense believed these were from dog treats used by a particularly ill-tempered German shepherd owned by Brian Albert. The defense expert said the marks on John's arms were consistent with dog teeth or dog claws. The German Shepherd was rehomed by Brian after John's death. Another defense expert said that John's injuries were consistent with a physical altercation. Two engineering experts testified for the defense. One said the damage to Karen's vehicle was not consistent with her hitting a pedestrian. The other said that John's injuries were not consistent with being struck by a vehicle. Data from John's cell phone indicated that he had changed elevation after exiting Karen's SUV, like he went up or down stairs. There were no stairs outside. There were stairs in the house. Massachusetts State Police Trooper Michael Proctor, who again was the lead investigator, made offensive comments in text messages. For example, he expressed disappointment that he had not seen a clothing-challenged image of Karen during his investigation. He also referred to her using an expletive that rhymes with ditch. And he said she had no blank, a word that rhymes with crass. Almost like the trooper was pained and perplexed by a pronounced paucity of posterior proportions. Michael claimed that he let his emotions get the best of him and admitted that he dehumanized Karen. After the trial, Michael was suspended without pay. It's possible that Karen struck and killed John, but she did not intend to kill him. Backing over somebody with a vehicle is a bizarre and unreliable method to select for murder. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Karen Reed was guilty? In my first video about this case, which I released before the trial, I said that I thought Karen Reed was guilty in reality of second-degree murder, but not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I was, however, convinced she was guilty of manslaughter beyond a reasonable doubt. In light of the evidence presented at trial, I have changed my position. The actions of Michael Proctor called the entire investigation into question. I now believe that Karen Reed is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of manslaughter as well. I continue to believe that she's guilty in reality of second-degree murder. That didn't change. So I think she really did it but I don't think the state can prove that she did it beyond a reasonable doubt. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Karen Reed was angry with John O'Keefe, and she was intoxicated. She put her SUV into reverse and slammed into him. Her intent may not have been to kill him, but he died after hitting his head on the pavement. I picture a situation where he was already intoxicated and off balance, so Karen hits him with the vehicle, he spins around, and falls to the ground. In doing this, he struck his head. So really, the fall killed him, but 
Karen caused the fall. Another possibility is that he was bending down and Karen hit him with the vehicle. So she hit his head directly with the taillight. There's really no way to know where the vehicle struck him, but those are some ideas. Realizing that she hit him, Karen backed into his Chevy to explain how the taillight became broken. The unusual circumstances of the case attracted the attention of people who despised the police in Massachusetts. They banded together and insisted there was some type of cover-up. Karen's defense was able to ride this wave of acrimony and distrust. In a curious twist, Michael Proctor's inappropriate behavior played right into the defense strategy. He was clearly biased against Karen and appeared to be thinking about her in sexual ways. At least a few members of the jury were highly offended by this, which led to the mistrial. I think this case speaks to the importance of police having integrity and running a thorough investigation. They have to act without passion or prejudice. They can't be wanting to find a particular person guilty. Their job should always be to find the truth. There's a lot of anger among members of the public against the police, and this anger needs an outlet. It builds up and becomes unbearable. People are looking for a case to latch on to, to let that anger free. Karen's bizarre case gave them exactly what they needed. There was no conspiracy to conceal evidence. It wasn't like other people killed John O'Keefe. However, there was one bad actor. The behavior of Michael Proctor was despicable, uncalled for, and tainted the entire investigation. By his own admission, his emotions were out of control. This is completely unacceptable and may have handed Karen a get-out-of-jail-free card. The state is in a tough position pushing forward with this prosecution. It's like they don't understand how bad Michael Proctor's behavior looks. They just want to separate the man from the investigation. Like, he may not be desirable, but the investigation was clean and well-managed. It's in no way tainted by his bias. I think the state is not appreciating the situation at hand. It would be in their best interest to develop the skill to read the room. That's my update on the Karen Reed case. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you soon.